but in any case, he has been an enormous, uh, enormously uh, positive influence on intellectual life in general, on my life in particular, uh, because he is the original uh, publisher of an article of mine, which some of you may have heard of or read. It's about a, a thing called the Chinese Room. I, I'll try not to mention it. I'm bored to death with the Chinese Room. Uh, you know, I feel like I got an A in that course, and I got the, my term paper in on time, and I don't have to take it over again. Uh, but in any case, Stephen has been an, an enormously a positive influence on me, and I'm grateful to him, immensely grateful both for organizing this conference and for inviting me. Now, I'm going to talk about consciousness. And uh, first of all, we ask, have to ask, well, why is it such a big deal? I mean, why don't we get busy and solve it as we do any other problem? Why is it, some people even have called it the hard problem? Uh, actually, I think there are some interesting technical problems in neurobiology, uh, but in I know the philosophical end, I don't think is a hard problem, and I'm going to give you a rather swift uh, solution uh, to the philosophical problem of consciousness and then show how it opens up into some more difficult neurobiological problems. Okay, what are the features of consciousness that make it seem puzzling or difficult? <clears throat> well, first of all, every conscious state has this qualitative feel to it. There's something it feels like to drink beer, and it's different from listening uh, to uh, music or scratching your head or pick your favorite, feeling the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism, one of my favorite conscious. I don't suffer from it myself, but many of my friends regard that as a limitation on my part. Uh, all of these states have a certain qualitative feel to them. Now, because of that, they have a second feature, namely, uh, they are subjective. Uh, they're ontologically subjective in a sense that they only exist insofar as they're experienced by a human or animal subject. Now, that subject-object distinction, subjective-objective, that's going to be a source of confusion. and It has been a source of confusion. I'm going to sort that out in a few minutes. And then a third feature of consciousness is it's always unified. So I don't just have... I, I don't just hear the sound of my voice and feel the weight of my body against my shoes and feel a slight headache from the Cabernet Sauvignon last night, but I have all of those as part of a single unified conscious field. Now, I used to think these were three independent features, a qualitativeness, subjectivity, and unity, but now I think they're really different aspects of one common feature of consciousness, uh, and I'm, by the way, not the first person to have noticed this. Immanuel Kant uh, noticed the unity of consciousness, as very few philosophers have done. And with, it, with his gift for catchy phrases, he called it the transcendental unity of apperception. Okay, I'm just calling it the unity of consciousness. Anyway, that's, what, that's the target. That's what we're trying to explain. Now, of course, there are lots of other features of consciousness. And the most important, from an evolutionary point of view, is Consciousness is typically directed or about something. It has what philosophers call intentionality. Uh, so I don't just think I think about this as opposed to thinking about that. Uh, and if you, we could add that as a fourth feature of consciousness, qualitativeness, subjectivity, unity, and intentionality. All right, now why is that supposed to be a problem? Well, I, in the end, I think, as I said, I don't think the philosophy part is all that difficult, but the neurobiology is, is tough, and I'm going to uh, talk about some of the difficulties. Now, the way I work is, I, when I'm working on a subject, I list at the very beginning what I think I know for a fact about the subject. Maybe we have to give up on some of these features uh, later, but for a fact, it seems to me, at least initially, we know the following about consciousness. One, it's real. And as a real phenomenon, it's irreducible. You can't get rid of it and pretend it's really something else. Now, why is that? Why can't, we've reduced a whole lot of things uh, to other things. We, we've shown that uh, uh, rainbows don't really exist and sunsets don't really exist. Both of those are illusions, uh, uh, optical illusions. Some people think color is also an illusion. Now, why couldn't we show that consciousness is an illusion in a way that we've shown that rainbows and sunsets and colors are illusions. And the answer is very revealing. The way that we showed that all of the others, those others were illusions was by making a distinction between reality and appearance. It appears that the sun sets in the west behind Mount Tamalpais, but the reality is that the earth rotates 
on its axis relative to the sun, and that gives us the illusion, and so on with the other cases. But now here's a striking feature about consciousness. For the very existence of consciousness, you cannot make the illusion reality distinction in a way that you can for sunsets, colors, and rainbows. Why? Because for the very existence of consciousness, if you have the conscious illusion that you are conscious, then you are conscious. That is, the illusion of consciousness is consciousness. Now, that isn't to say you can't be mistaken. We make all kinds, Descartes was wrong about that. We make all kinds of mistakes about consciousness. Uh, we misidentify our own conscious states. Uh, you thought you were deeply in love, but it turned out you'd had a lot to drink, and she looked pretty good in that light. And you know, the whole scene was, uh, I gave you a, a, a mistaken conception. So introspection is not a sure method. But for the very existence of conscious states, they are real and irreducible. Well, why are they irreducible? Uh, well, <clears throat> part of the answer is because they have this first person or subjective ontology. And for that reason, they can't be reduced to anything that has a third person or objective ontology. I'm going to get back to that because that's an important point. OK, the second feature of consciousness, along with its uh, reality, <clears throat> is, as far as we know, it is entirely caused by neurobiological processes in the brain. The only consciousness that we know to exist is human and animal consciousness, and that exists in certain sorts of neurobiological systems. Now, I think the most fascinating question in the biological sciences today is, how exactly does the brain do it? That is an amazing fact. And I have to tell you, when I first got interested in this subject about 30 or so years ago, I thought, well, why don't these guys get busy and solve the problem? <laughs> so I went over uh, to UCSF, and there was a guy named Ben Libet who was working on this kind of stuff. And I started nagging him, why don't you get busy and solve the problem of consciousness? And he said, look, in my field, in neurobiology, it's OK to be interested in consciousness, but get tenure first. Get tenure first, then you can work on consciousness. Now, one sign of progress over the past 30 years is now you can get tenure by working on consciousness. And I hope many of you uh, are doing exactly that. Uh, but in any case, it was not regarded uh, as a subject, as a, uh, uh, as a legitimate subject. I mean, figuring out the number of carbon rings and serotonin, that's honest to John science. At the end of the day, people feel like they've put in a day's work. But consciousness, it, uh, as one guy said to me, we can't be interested in consciousness. That's for philosophers and theologians. Well, thanks a lot. But in any case, <laughs> um, uh, that, that has changed. There has been a major change. OK. So proposition one, consciousness is real and irreducible. Proposition two, it's entirely caused by uh, neurobiological processes. It's entirely caused. Uh, we persist in thinking that the neuron is the functional unit, and that may be wrong. I mean, maybe Jerry Edelman's right that it's whole maps of neurons or clouds of neurons. Uh, and I have colleagues in Berkeley who think you have to take big clouds of neurons, and they have to have certain kinds of mathematical treatment. But in any case, it's going on in the brain and not in the toenail. And we've got to figure out exactly how it works. OK, now the third proposition is that consciousness is realized in the brain. It exists. It's right there in the brain. All human and animal consciousness actually occurs. It's realized in the human brain at a higher level than that of the neuron and the synapse, and probably at a higher level than that of whole groups of neurons. We don't know exactly uh, what the right anatomy and physiology is, and I'll talk about some of those problems later. But consciousness is real. It's caused by neurobiological processes. It exists itself as a neurobiological phenomenon realized in the brain. And now proposition number four, it functions causally. It's causally real in our behavior. If you have, I mean, there's always some philosopher who will say, well, you know, consciousness can't function causally because it's not part of the physical world, and the physical world is causally closed. So you get this absurd view, epiphenomenalism, of the view that consciousness doesn't really make any difference. You think it doesn't make any difference? Just watch. 
I decide to raise my arm and the damn thing goes up. And here's an amazing fact. I don't say, well, that's the thing about the old arm. Some day she goes up and some day she doesn't go up. It's like a weather in Montreal. No, it's up to me. You want to see consciousness in action? Just watch it. This is much more fun than the angst of post-industrial man under late capitalism is changing reality just by deciding to change it. Okay, now why isn't all that stuff I told you? I think all that stuff is obviously true. Why is there supposed to be a problem? Well, it seems like there's a problem because we've got this horrible tradition that says consciousness is not a real part of the real world. Uh, let me give you a simple proof that it is. I said, my conscious intention in action caused my arm to go up, but we know independently that anything that caused my arm to go up must cause the secretion of acetylcholine at the axon end plates of the motor neurons. No acetylcholine, no arm movement. And it's so a top-down causation. Somebody puts a gun to my head and says, secrete acetylcholine at the axon end plates of your motor neurons. Watch, I'll just do it, no problem. All right, but now then you have an interesting result. You got the result that my conscious intention and action caused my arm uh, to go up. But anything that caused my arm to go up must cause the secretion of acetylcholine. So my consciousness, intention, and action caused the secretion of acetylcholine. But that could only be done by something that was itself neurobiological. So my conscious intention and action is a neurobiological phenomenon. Now this is the one, uh, this is uh, the philosophically most important point I've made so far, and that is, we will only understand consciousness, as I believe it should be understood, as a natural biological phenomenon if you see that the, the existence of consciousness is part of complex phenomena going on in the brain, and the same event can be described at different levels. It can be described as uh, raising your arm, or causing the secretion of acetylcholine at the axon end plates, and that's together with all the other stuff, the ion channels and the myosin and the actin filaments and all these things that, uh, that are in the standard undergraduate textbooks. You have one and the same phenomenon that admits of different levels of description. That's not a mystery. That's true of any natural phenomenon. My car won't start. What do I say? Do I go to the mechanic and say, well, uh, the uh, passage of electrons is insufficient uh, to sustain the oxidization of the hydrocarbon molecules. No, I say the damn thing won't start. I think there's something wrong with the plugs. But of course, that's exactly what I was saying when I said the passage of electrons is insufficient to uh, sustain the uh, the oxidization of the hydrocarbon molecules. By the way, in Berkeley, you could probably uh, do that bit about the hydrocarbons because there are a lot of unemployed physicists working in garages. <laughs> But for most of us human beings, we think in, in terms of the higher level, the plugs, the spark plugs, uh, and, and the uh, uh, firing in the cylinder. We don't think about the oxidization of the hydrocarbons and the passage of the electrons. Yeah, it was pretty funny. When I was working on this, I thought, well, how the hell does it work? And I asked a physicist friend of mine, how does the spark plug actually work? And they would mumble something about ionization or something like that. I finally found it on something called Nordstrom's Encyclopedia. This was before the days of Google. Um, and it, yes, it is the passage of electrons. Uh, OK, <clears throat> so I have given you what I think are four propositions, which I think are obviously true. And they're the propositions that we should start with in our explanation of consciousness. Now, one way or another, they are routinely denied. I, and I'm going to tell you about some of those denials. They are routinely denied. Uh, the uh, basic idea I'm getting, trying to get across is consciousness is a biological phenomenon like um, mitosis or photosynthesis or digestion or the secretion of bile. It's a higher level biological phenomenon. And like all higher level biological phenomena, it, it's grounded in lower level cellular uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and we need an explanation of how exactly it works. Why is it so difficult to get that message across? Well, I've reluctantly come to the conclusion that there are two invisible features. Well, they're not so invisible. Uh, there are two features of our intellectual tradition uh, that are seldom mentioned. It's sort of almost impolite to mention them, but I think they hang like a shadow over this whole discussion. The first feature 
is the tradition of God, the soul, and immortality. And the idea is that if consciousness exists at all, then it has to exist in the soul. Uh, and the soul is not a part of the physical world. Uh, whatever it is, it's not part of physics. So one tradition that we're militating against is God, the soul, and immortality. And I have to tell you, there's an irony here in that I uh, finally realized this when I was debating people in what I call strong artificial intelligence, to realize that they were, in effect, part of that tradition. They couldn't see that consciousness is a biological phenomenon like digestion. As Dan Dennett said somewhere, I know consciousness is formal and abstract. What's formal and abstract about wanting to throw up or having a hangover headache? I mean, it's, I, I, philosophers always like to take these arcane examples, but think of more gutsy. I won't go through all the sordid list of things I can think of, but if you think of actual conscious states, I, there's nothing formal and abstract about them. I, so we, that, we have to get out of this idea that consciousness has this special mysterious mode of existence. Now, the second tradition is just as bad, or nearly as bad, and that is a misconception of something called science, with a capital S. And the picture that this tradition gives us is that science is supposed to be the name of a set of propositions. And those propositions are materialist and reductionist. Science, by its very essence on this conception, is materialist and reductionist. There's no place in science for anything that has the characteristics that I mentioned, qualitativeness, subjectivity, uh, unity, I, and the sort of causation that I describe as intentional causation. Uh, so the, the, the science is mistakenly taken to be the name of a set of established truths. It's not. It's the name of a set of institutional structures that have evolved certain techniques certain methods over the past several centuries for improving our knowledge. I, and it is, I think, it is the most stunning intellectual achievement of the human uh, race. The most amazing fact about our species is that we've reached a point where knowledge grows. That's the central intellectual fact. But if you think that science is supposed to be the name of a set of established truths, you're in for disappointment. I have been telling my students literally now for decades that we know that the universe consists of physical particles, uh, that these, and, and I go through the usual list of, of uh, atomic and subatomic particles. Well, it turns out that that now composes 4% of the universe. What's the other 96%? Dark matter and dark energy. What's dark about it? Darkness here is epistemic. It means these guys don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> no, okay, I'm paying them to figure this out. But whenever I think, no, science is the name of a set of established results, uh, one uh, result that I was uh, brought up on was a certain atomic conception of the atomic nature of ultimate reality. And it turns out that we now uh, have pretty good evidence that that's about 4%. Anyway, the point I'm trying to get across is don't think that science is the name of a set of established truths and materialism and reductionism are <clears throat> the uh, basic established truths. No, think of it as the name of a, a set of methods that we've evolved for finding out how uh, things work, about how nature is. And the reason it's universal is that anything you can study systematically uh, can be science. You can, it can now be, can be thought of as a science if you can study it systematically uh, using methods that are designed to get at how things actually work. All right, so I think part of our um, difficulty then in uh, getting an account of consciousness has been that we're militating against uh, these uh, uh, two, these twin uh, uh, false views that we've inherited over several centuries. We've inherited them uh, oh, at least since the 17th century and some of them uh, even annotating that. Now, with all of that said, I want to now go through a list of some very common mistakes, or at least I take them to be mistakes, and there'll be plenty of time in the discussion for you to challenge me if you think they're not mistakes. The first is, there's supposed to be a tremendous problem about the evolutionary function of consciousness. We could imagine robots I, that were zombies 
and behave exactly like you or me, but have no consciousness at all. But then if we can imagine that, then it seems, well, maybe consciousness doesn't have any function. Maybe it's just epiphenomenal after all. Now, I think that's such a bad argument. I'm amazed that anybody can state it, but let me say, tell you what's wrong with it as an argument. When we look for the evolutionary function of a phenotype, you have to respect how nature actually works. Uh, if you look at birds' wings, originally I'm told they functioned uh, as devices for keeping the bird warm, and then they evolved into devices in spe many species of birds that enable the bird to fly. Now, it's no answer if I say, well, what's the function of the robin's wings uh, to say it enables the robin to fly? to say, well, you could imagine robins were born equipped with rocket engines. Uh, well, you could imagine that as science fiction. Now, you could imagine I, that we could do all the things we do uh, without consciousness, but that's not how nature works. Think of just about everything you do, and you will find consciousness is pretty much coextensive with your life. Uh, my uh, favorites are the, are the four Fs of the biology textbooks that are fighting fleeing, feeding, and sexual intercourse. Uh, and in my experience, at least, I can't do any of them uh, without being conscious. Uh, you've got to have consciousness in order to conduct a normal life. Uh, and I think the problem with, with consciousness is not that we uh, can't think what its function is. It's got too many. I mean, it is stunning the sheer amount of information that we're able to incorporate in a single moment of consciousness all the stuff that comes in through vision, all of the organization of our memory, all of our antecedent knowledge that we bring to bear on a present situation. I, in, in the latter decades of the 20th century, it used to be common in commencement speeches for scientists, uh, the uh, Chancellor of Berkeley was one who uh, made uh, this speech, uh, who said, by the end of the century, we will all have household robots that will uh, do all the housework, take care of the children, entertain us with light conversation, help us with our income tax, and do all the things that we'd like a household robot to do. Now, by about 1990, they stopped saying that because the end of the century was becoming clear. We're nowhere near having robots that can do that kind of stuff. When General Motors uh, switched their uh, production lines to robotics, they found they had to redo the production line because uh, you have to have it to the right millimeter. Uh, the robot can't sort of make adjustments the way uh, that a normal human welder can. Uh, but why is it? Why is it that robotics has been so disappointing? I think at least one possible answer is the obvious one, namely, we don't know how to make a conscious robot. What you have are in, you can do various kinds of information processing, and the information processing uh, uh, will enable you uh, to uh, implement algorithms of a uh, useful kind. I think, I think uh, robots are immensely useful and no doubt will become more so. But until we have a conscious robot, it looks like it's going to be very hard to attain the kind of flexibility and a, a global a comprehensive uh, ways of coping with the environment that conscious agents have. Okay, so that's the first mistake, the mistake about, well, what are the special functions of consciousness? Now, a second mistake, and I think probably not common among uh, uh, this group, but it's worth pointing it out. In our intellectual culture, there's a big deal about the distinction between what's subjective and what's objective. But unfortunately, uh, that distinction between the objective and the subjective is systematically ambiguous between an epistemic sense and an ontological sense. Where I, I'm sorry to use this fancy jargon, epistemic means having to do with knowledge and ontology means having to do with existence. Epistemically, the objective-subjective distinction is a distinction between types of claims. So if I say uh, Rembrandt was born in 1606, that is epistemically objective because you can settle it as a matter of fact. If I say Rembrandt was the greatest Dutch painter that ever lived, well, that's, as they say, a subjective matter of opinion. That's epistemically subjective. But the basis of the epistemic subjective on 
epistemic distinction is an ontological distinction in modes of existence. Some entities, uh, most of the entities dealt with by physics, for example, have an existence which is independent of being experienced. Mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates all are ontologically objective. They exist independently of experience. But pains and tickles and itches are ontologically subjective. They exist only insofar as they are experienced. Now, why is it so important to keep this distinction in mind? Well, a standard argument, I mentioned this earlier, that I used to get from uh, physicists, from uh, neurobiologists, was, look, science is objective. On your own account, consciousness is subjective. So there can be no science of consciousness. Now, you all recognize that's a bad argument. That's a fallacy of ambiguity because objective and subjective are being used in two different senses. In the epistemic sense, science is indeed objective in the sense that science seeks uh, to find out uh, how things work in a way that's independent of the feelings and the attitudes of the investigators. But, and this is the bottom line of this part of the discussion, the epistemic objectivity of science does not prevent us from having an epistemically objective science of a domain that's ontologically subjective. No uh, I, a fact about the subjective ontology of consciousness makes it impossible to have an epistemically objective science. And I've often heard people say, but you couldn't have a science of consciousness. Uh, well, really, I go to the medical section of your uh, university bookstore and look at the section on neurology. See, these poor doctors have to deal with patients that are actually in pain. And they have to try to figure out how does pain work and what sorts of uh, analgesics will be best at alleviating pain. So the important point that I want to emphasize here is that the ontological subjectivity is no bar to epistemic objectivity. You can have a completely objective science of a domain that is ontologically subjective. Now that distinction between these two senses of the objective-subjective distinction leads to an even more important distinction, and that's a distinction between those features of the world that exist independent of our feelings and attitudes, I'll call those observer independent, from those features of the world that are observer relative. So mountains, molecules, and tectonic plates are all observer independent, but money, private property, government, and marriage all of those exist only relative to people's attitudes. They are observer relative, not observer independent. Now, one of the uh, important features of this distinction is that the observer relative features of reality, like money, property, government, and marriage, all contain an element of ontological subjectivity. It's only money because we, peop we think it's money. Now, the fact that there is an element of ontological subjectivity in economic phenomena does not prevent us from having an epistemically objective science of economics. You can have an objective science of a domain that contains ontologically subjective components. It's an unfortunate feature that economists tend to forget that economics is not like physics. When I studied economics, they taught us that marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Other way, in physics, we learned that force equals mass times acceleration. They're really quite different. Uh, one is based on human attitudes and human ontological subjectivity, but you can have an objective science of such a domain. Now, there's a deeper reason why I want to get this across, and that is several attempts to explain consciousness appeal to observer relative phenomena in the explanation. That can't be right. Consciousness has an observer independent ontology, even though it's a subjective ontology. 
And that's just a fancy way of saying my consciousness exists regardless of what anybody says. If all of neurobiologists get together and say, we've done a study of you, Searle, and we've concluded that you're totally unconscious, that you really are just a zombie, I don't think, gosh, maybe I'm just a zombie. No, I know they are mistaken because my consciousness has an observer-independent existence. Okay, now it gets a little bit tricky here because all observer-relative phenomena are created by consciousness. I mean, uh, some unconscious forms of intentionality as well, but roughly speaking, all observer-relative phenomena are created by consciousness. So the consciousness itself can't be observer-relative without an infinite regress. I mean, you wouldn't be able to explain the existence of observer-relative phenomena if the consciousness that created them was itself observer-relative. But it follows from this, the fact that consciousness, though ontologically subjective, has an observer-relative, as an observer-independent existence, it follows that you cannot explain consciousness in observer-relative terms. Now, there are two attempts to do that that are worth calling your attention to. One is the computational theory of consciousness. The problem is, what's the definition of computation? And the accounts that I have seen, uh, going back to Turing, are all observer relative. Watch, I'll show you a simple computer. This thing just computed the function s equals one half gt squared. I, it did it with a certain amount of interference from the floor. <laughs> and, uh, but that's just typical of us lab uh, scientists. We have to face these uh, experimental problems on a daily basis. Uh, uh, the point is, anything can be described as a computer. See, this computes that function. And indeed, we, you could if you had accurate enough measuring devices. Uh, you could uh, actually use it uh, to calculate uh, the, uh, the value of s to calculate the distance that it fell. Uh, but if this is a computer, then anything is a computer. Anything can be described computationally. In the old Chinese room days, when I used to argue this stuff with, the, uh, with people, there would come a moment in the debate when I would take an object like this, slam it down on the table, and say, this is a digital computer, just as a boring program. Program says, stay there. Uh, uh, and of course, that's right. Anything can be described. Uh, as zeros and ones, but what does that tell you? That tells you computation does not name a natural force like gravity. Computation is a, exists relative uh, to the interpreter and the user. Now, people think if something is observer relative, then it must be arbitrary. Not so. Most observer relative phenomena, uh, particularly functional phenomena, are only able to function in virtue of their physical structure. But the fact that this is a comb and that this, I have my pocket uh, full of uh, uh, observer relative uh, uh, phenomena that all of them have functions, uh, the observer relativity does not imply that it's arbitrary, but it does imply that there's an element of ontological subjectivity. If we decided to use this as an object of religious worship or as a paperweight, it ceases to function as a comb and would cease to be a comb, uh, even though it was designed and is used as a Home. So observer relativity does not imply arbitrariness, but it does imply an element of ontological subjectivity. You could not give a computational explanation of consciousness uh, because consciousness is observer relative and computation, except for these rare cases where a guy actually consciously does a computation, where he actually computes a function, here, this is an observer-independent computation, but when my pocket calculator does that, it's observer-relative. Intrinsically, the pocket calculator is just an electronic uh, circuit. Uh, okay, another a more recent effort to do this is to find information-theoretic explanations of consciousness, and I'm in the middle of trying to review a book by Christoph Kochmar. He is influenced a lot by Tononi, and I have great admiration for these guys. I think they're very smart. But the account of information that they give us is straight observer relative. Uh, now, maybe they can have an observer independent explanation, but I haven't been able to find it yet. It's like computation. It, it, it's worth pointing out the relation of this argument that I'm giving here to the Chinese room. The Chinese room argument rested on the fact that the syntax of the computer program 
was not by itself sufficient for the semantics of mental states of human cognition. Syntax is not semantics. But this is actually a deeper argument. This argument says syntax is observer relative. You can't get semantics out of syntax, but you can't get syntax out of physics. The syntax is not intrinsic to the physics. The syntax exists relative to an interpretation. So I really made, uh, uh, well, three points so far that I, I want to just summarize them because they might be useful if they come up in the discussion. Uh, one uh, is that I, there, that there is no problem about does consciousness have an evolutionary function. It's got too many. We don't know where to start or even where to end if we're trying to list all of them. The second is that you need a clear distinction between the uh, uh, epistemic uh, sense of the uh, subjective-objective distinction and the ontological sense. And the third is you need a clear distinction between observer-relative phenomena, which may be subject to all of the epistemic objectivity you could desire. I mean, it really is Canadian money, this stuff that I have. Uh, it's epistemically objective. But, of course, it's money in a fashion that is observer-relative. And you need a clear distinction between those features of reality that are observer-relative and those features that are observer-independent. OK. Well, now, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, what? Doing I'm doing fine. OK, that means, I guess it means I get to keep talking. Um, but I, I want to save plenty of time uh, for discussion. OK, now, let me then discuss some current efforts to solve the problem of consciousness. I, in the early days of this research, uh, there was a great search for the neuronal correlate of consciousness, the NCC, as it was called. And with imaging techniques, uh, we did get quite a lot of interesting NCCs. Uh, indeed, uh, you could. I, I'm always suspicious, incidentally, when these guys display their wonderful results on the blackboard of fMRI. I've been in those damn machines. How do they get the subjects to hold still that long? And one wonderful lecturer earlier today said, well, they had a problem. Half of the subjects wiggled around too much, and they didn't get any data out of them. I, I would have been one of those subjects, because I get very impatient in these things. But in any case, we do have imaging techniques uh, that enable us uh, to find various NCCs. And uh, many of you will be f uh, familiar uh, with this research, so I'll go over it very briefly. One uh, spectacular uh, uh, mode where you could look for this uh, is the case of blind sight. If you can find exactly the distinction uh, neurobiologically, uh, anatomically, and physiologically, between uh, the pathway that produces normal conscious visual experience and the pathway that produces blind sight, then it looks like you would have found the NCC, you, if you got exactly that distinction. Another set of interesting cases are the gestalt uh, switching cases. And my favorite is uh, the Yastro Wittgenstein duck rabbit, which I will now do an incompetent job of drawing. And that's either a rabbit looking up uh, that way or a duck looking that way. Now, there's several things to notice about this. Uh, one is, it doesn't look the least bit actually like a duck or a rabbit. If you said somebody, go in the store and buy a rabbit, and they brought you some, something that looked like that, you'd, you know, some, you'd think something is really radically wrong here. Uh, but the other thing, and this is what's interesting to us philosophically, you get a totally different experience with a stimulus held absolutely constant. There's no question what, what the phenomenology of seeing the duck is different from the phenomenology of seeing the rabbit, but the stimulus is constant. Now, if you could find the point in the brain where the brain, and here I, I talk in this homunculus vocabulary, it's a metaphor, uh, where the brain makes up its mind, I'm going to see the duck, uh, and now I'm going to see the rabbit. If you could find that point, you'd have the NCC for those experiences. You see this, the beauty of the gestalt uh, switching experiments is that the stimulus is constant, but the phenomenology is different. The, ex uh, the experience is quite different. Now, another uh, a beautiful bunch of uh, experiments was done by Logothetis and his people in, in uh, Germany. I, and what they did was 
do um, uh, it's a variation on the same idea, a binocular rivalry. So if you show uh, vertical lines to one eye and horizontal lines to the other eye, uh, the, uh, the, the visual experience is typically not of a grid. Uh, one side or the other wins. Either the, the, um, uh, the horizontal lines win or the vertical lines win. And if you could find the point at which uh, the brain decides that it's going to see the vertical lines or the horizontal lines, it looks like you'd have the NCC. Now, why does that excite people? Why does that seem like it's a big deal? Well, presumably, the mechanisms by which the brain produces these experiences will be common to all conscious uh, vis uh, visual experiences and maybe to all consciousness. See, uh, Crick and Watson didn't have to figure out how the DNA produces every phenotype. All they had to do was get a mechanism uh, uh, by which uh, uh, the replication was done, and that will apply generally. So the idea was that if you could find the NCC, if you could get uh, the, uh, the mechanism by which a single experience is produced, that might give you the key to understanding everything. And then, in addition to all of these, a natural way to do it, a natural way to look for the NCC, to, the key to consciousness, might be just to track a stimulus, track uh, the visual experience as it goes through all of the, uh, over the optic chiasma and through the various uh, uh, stages of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, visual cortex and then until finally it produces a visual experience. Track it down until you've actually located the visual experience. Now, a lot of very important and interesting work was done, but I have to say I think most of the people who did it were disappointed in that they did not get what they had hoped for. They didn't get a key to understanding consciousness. Why not? Well, I'm not enough of an, uh, an expert on this to judge, but I'll, I'll point out one thing that's interesting to me, and that is all of these cases, all of these experiments were done on subjects that are already conscious. See, the picture that they have is that the perception is creating consciousness, and I want to suggest a different picture. Think of perception not as creating consciousness, but as perception as modifying a pre-existing conscious field. Imagine you wake up in a completely dark room uh, so that you have minimal uh, stimulus input. Uh, maybe you feel the weight of the covers or the uh, weight of your body against the bed, but you're there in an absolutely dark room with minimal uh, stimulus input and no perceptual input. Now, you can still be fully conscious. You can be 100% consciousness. Now imagine you turn on the lights and you get up and brush your teeth and get dressed and all the rest of it. Are you creating consciousness? Well, in a sense, you are, of course, but I want to say we should think of that as modifying the pre-existing conscious field. What we want to know is how does the brain create the conscious field in the first place? And that's a much tougher task than figuring out the NCC of particular stimuli. And I'm, I, I'm not up to the minute on this, and there are probably people here who can bring me up to date. But what, last time I looked at this, there were some labs that did this sort of research, where you try to figure how, out how the brain creates the entire conscious field. Uh, Wolf Singer uh, in Germany and Rodolfo Linus at uh, NYU Medical School both did research uh, along this line, which I think is more promising, though it's much harder to do. Because if your methods are imaging techniques and single cell recordings, it's very hard to figure out how the whole brain creates consciousness. But I think that was the source uh, of uh, a lot of the disappointment. Uh, Francis Crick once said to me uh, that he was uh, very uh, frustrated and annoyed I, uh, that it was so much harder to figure out consciousness than it had been to figure out DNA. DNA seemed relatively easy compared to consciousness. And I had to laugh. I pointed out, we've been working on this for about 2,000 years now, so we can't expect to solve it immediately. But the message that I want to get across on this part of the talk, and indeed I think it's really, in a way, the message uh, of, the, of the whole conference, at least the talks that I have been able to hear and the abstracts I've read, uh, is that if we think of consciousness as a natural biological phenomenon, as just part of our biological life history, I, then it is uh, a difficult 
but not a metaphysically impossible problem to solve. And indeed, the steps by which you solve it are familiar from the history of the sciences. Uh, step one uh, is you try to find the correlates. You try to find uh, what states of rain are correlated with consciousness. And what I'm suggesting is that the more important question is not about particular experiences, such as the experience of the color red, but the creation of the conscious field, the creation of the total conscious uh, field is what our target ought to be, and that's much harder to do. But the, but the first is you look for correlations. The second stage is you test to see if the correlations are causal. And there again, the tests are, are quite familiar to us. Uh, can you, if you found what you thought was the NCC uh, for uh, the creation of the conscious field, can you create consciousness in an otherwise unconscious subject uh, by t turning on that NCC? And can you turn off consciousness uh, by uh, uh, turning off uh, the uh, NCC? Can you, do you have causally uh, necessary and sufficient conditions, other things equal, do you have causally necessary and sufficient conditions for the creation of consciousness? And then third, uh, we would like a theory. We'd like a theory that says, uh, why does it work this way and not some other way? I, I, I myself think that this is a very challenging scientific project, uh, 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 trying to figure out exactly how the brain creates a conscious field. But if I, there's one important philosophical message, it is this. I don't think there's any philosophical obstacle here at all. I think that the philosophical tradition has given us this mistaken conception that there's something tremendously mysterious and mystical and metaphysical about consciousness which would prevent us ever from having a science of consciousness. We've lived through that before. A hundred years ago, perhaps on this very spot, uh, there was a huge debate about between vitalism and mechanism. And a lot of very good biologists and philosophers thought, well, you can never have a mechanistic explanation of life. Life is too mysterious to explain life. You have to have an élan vital. Some nonsense sounds much better in French. Um, <laughs> I, I discovered this when I was debating a bunch of uh, French uh, deconstructionists, and it, it's very hard to uh, talk English about la textualité du texte, but it can sound almost halfway intelligent <laughs> if, you, if you talk uh, in, in, uh, in French. But in any case, there was a huge debate. Now we can't recover that. None of us can feel the passion that surrounded the debate between mechanism and vitalism. And what I want to suggest is we want to get to the same situation where consciousness is concerned, where we see it as what it really is, a natural biological phenomenon. Now, another uh, item in the history of the, of the sciences, which I think is like this, is electromagnetism. If you're brought up to believe the world is essentially Newtonian, then electromagnetism looks pretty spooky, really mysterious. How the hell do those magnets... I, I, the, the magnetic field, how does it obey Newton's laws? Uh, it looks uh, very mysterious. Once we had Clark Maxwell's equations, uh, then it ceased to be a mystery. And what I'm suggesting is we're now in the situation uh, with consciousness where people were in, uh, in the de days of the debate between mechanism and vitalism or before they had Clark Maxwell's equations. And what I hope is that uh, some of you, maybe some uh, group or team of you, will be the group that actually finally solves this problem. I think it will be the greatest intellectual achievement so far in this century. Thank you very much.